Greetings, Mantophiles. Welcome to a video on a discrete probability distribution called the hypergeometric. Do not be afraid of the six syllables. If you know something about combinations, what they're for and how to calculate them, all of what we're going to say is going to be accessible to you. It will be helpful if you know some things about the binomial distribution, although you can still get everything you need to get out of this with regard to the hypergeometric uh, without being familiar with the binomial. We're going to imagine that we have some objects in a container. It's sort of traditional in the world of probability to call it an urn. You can think of it as a bucket, uh, whatever you like. We are going to imagine that we have seven blue uh, balls, marbles, whatever you want, and five that are red. Doesn't much matter what they are, just matters that seven of them are blue and five of them are red. And we're going to reach in and we're going to draw four of them. And we're going to ask, what's the probability that we end up with one blue one and three red ones? This is going to depend on how we do the drawing. If we reach in, grab one, look at its color, stick it back in, mix them up, grab another one, look at its color, um, and do that four times in a row, that's called sampling with replacement. I sample, I replace, I sample again. If we just grab four of them all at once uh, in a handful, if you like, that would be sampling without replacement. And as you might imagine, it makes a difference which of those we do. If I'm sampling with replacement, then every time I reach in, the probability that I get a blue ball is 7 twelfths. If I'm sampling without replacement, I reach in, let's say I pull one out, it's the blue one, one of the blue ones, and I set it aside. Now when I reach in again, the probability that the second one is blue is no longer 7 twelfths, it's 6 elevenths. Now, depending on all the circumstances, you may or may not end up with a tremendously noticeable difference uh, in the probabilities that you end up with at the end. But as we'll see, uh, it can matter quite a bit depending on all the circumstances. Just for comparison purposes, let's imagine first that we're doing it with replacement. So those of you who have some familiarity, this is gonna be binomial. And we're gonna reach in and get four. We wanna know the probability that of the four, one is blue and three are red. Well, there's a formula, but we can sort of talk our way through this as well. The probability that I get one blue is seven fifths, or sorry, seven twelfths. I'm gonna get one of those. The probability that I get a red one is five twelfths. And I'm imagining that I'm going to get three of those. So any outcome that involves one blue and three reds, if the draws are independent, and presumably they are if we're replacing, the probability of any one of those outcomes is just going to be the product of these four probabilities, a 7 twelfths and three 5 twelfths. Now, how many such outcomes are there? There are four, or if we're being a little more formal, four choose one because either the first of my four is blue and the others are red, or the second, or the third, or the fourth. If I do this calculation, I get about 0.17. And incidentally, in, in terms of the notation, uh, you may be more familiar with the notation for combinations that uses the C. I'm a fan of the parenthesis notation just because I can do it faster, um, but you know, just so we're clear on what I mean when I write that. Now, if we are not replacing, that's where we end up with this thing that we're going to call the hypergeometric. I wish somebody had uh, coined a friendlier term for this because it's really not that unfriendly a concept. So this is without replacement. We wanna know what's the probability that we again get one blue and three red. Well, my denominator is going to be the number of ways I can reach into the bucket of 12 objects and get four of them. And that, if you have some familiarity with combinations, is 12 choose four, number of combinations of 12 things taken four at a time. Numerator 
is going to be the number of ways I can get one of them to be blue and three of them to be red. Well, there are seven blues, and I'm imagining that I'm going to get one of them. There are five reds, and I'm imagining that I'm going to get three of them. And so the total number of ways that I can get a blue and three reds ought to be the number of ways I can get a blue times the number of ways I can get three reds. If we do the arithmetic, this is 7 times 10 divided by 495, which is about 0.14. Not stunningly different to the binomial, uh, to the width replacement case, but not identical either. Let's take a look at the formalities with an eye toward making a formula, although I think probably you'll agree that a formula may not be necessary, given how this is such a natural outcome of the way combinations work. But just for the record, suppose we have a grand total of n objects, of which s are successes. This is just a term of art in the world of statistics that mean they have some feature that's of interest to us, okay? So it doesn't, it doesn't imply a value judgment. It could mean that we're interested in blues and so blue is a success. Um, that's all it is. Then we're going to have N minus S failures, if you will. That's just failures to have whatever the attribute is that we're interested in. That's again, uh, a value judgment. And let's imagine that we're going to draw little n of these objects without replacement. And we're going to ask the question, what is the probability that k of them will be successes that will have the feature of interest? Well, what is our denominator? It's the number of ways we can reach into a set of big n objects and retrieve little n of them. How many ways can we get k of them to be successes? Well, there are s successes floating around in the original set. Should be s choose k ways of getting k successes. How many failures are there? There are n big N minus s. And if we got k successes in our little n sample, how many failures did we get? We should have got little n minus k. And and this structure has a feature that you may have noticed when we were looking at it numerically, and that is that the number of successes plus the number of failures has to equal the total number of objects in the original set, and the number of successes plus the number of failures has to equal the total number of objects in the set that we've drawn or sampled. So uh, the top two up here in the numerator have to add to this top number in the denominator, and same thing for the bottom numbers. And that's a nice quick little check uh, once you've set up one of these things numerically. Just make sure that uh, there are no at least obvious mistakes that can be detected in that fashion. Uh, again, for the record, the mean of this distribution is little n times s divided by big N. There is a formula for the standard deviation. I have never in my life used it. Um, but just for the record, it looks like this. Uh, should you ever have occasion to want to know the standard deviation of some hypergeometric distribution, uh, my advice would be to let some gadget do it. Find some statistics package that'll crank it for you. Before we finish off, let's do one more example that will also give us an opportunity to look briefly at an entire distribution and to compare it to the uh, somewhat analogous um, binomial. So let's suppose that we have three yellow and two orange objects in some set. And we're going to reach in and draw three of them. And we want to know what's the probability that k of those three are yellow. Well, how many ways can I get three different objects out of a set of five? 
five, choose three. I have three yellows. I'm asking how many ways I can get K of them. I have two uh, oranges, or all that really matters is they're not yellow. And I'm asking how many ways I can get three minus K of those, the remainder out of the three. Three plus two is five, K plus three minus K is three, good to go. And I should just be able to then plug in the values of K uh, that are relevant in this situation. And so let's take a look at the graphs that uh, arise from that, because I think you'll find it a little interesting. First, I'll show the relevant binomial. Uh, so that would be the same situation, except we were sampling with replacement. And as you can see, uh, these are the probabilities that you would obtain if you use that formula. The interesting thing about the hypergeometric is that the probability that you get no yellows is zero. If, you, if there are only two oranges and I'm drawing three objects, then I have to have at least one yellow, right? I gotta, I gotta round out the three and there are no more oranges. So one of the things you see with a hypergeometric that you don't see with a binomial is that some things are not possible. And so it's just, it's interesting to observe the differences uh, that potentially are there uh, between situations where you are replacing, situations where you're not replacing, even though all of the other conditions, uh, aside from the replacement question, are identical. I hope this has been interesting. I hope this will be useful to you in your study of probability. Happy mathing.